I also noticed the end was to serve the poor and needy. No, he did not tithe. I find this interesting. When we think of tithe, we think of giving 10%, right? That's what we think. Now we know, and we're going to study this over the next few weeks, that in the Old Testament, a tithe was a series of 5 and 10% giving. That actually equated to about 25% of the annual revenue a person brought in in Jewish culture. About 25%. In the New Testament, we learned that tithing was not a percentage, but it was a proportion of what God gave us. And so we learned in the New Testament that we're to give what we can give and live off only what we need to live off. Everything else we give away that we don't need. And we're going to look at that over the next couple of weeks. But we find out that in Zacchaeus's situation here, he gave 50% of what he had away. Now think about that. Didn't that blow you away? If every week we came to the offering bag and everybody gave 50% of what they brought in that week to the Lord. Imagine what that would do. I was reading again this week about R.G. Letourneau. We mentioned him in the past and I'm probably going to talk about him a little bit next week. But he gave 90% of his income to the Lord. And lived on 10%. Now, I know people read that and think about that. And think, oh, well, he was a very, very wealthy man. But in his own words, you cannot outgive God. And he started giving God 90% before he became wealthy. And attributes that wealth to the Lord providing. And so there's that tension that exists within our hearts and minds. Is that what do we give? But here's an example where Zacchaeus gave 50% of what he had. The question we talked about last week in CPU was, are we more concerned about our standard of living or about our standard of giving? What are we more concerned? We also know that the end, the end for Zacchaeus, his purpose, his goal, his vision was to rely on Jesus for his needs, not in his money as he relied in the past. We also notice the end was to tell you and me about financial reconciliation that is a part of our spiritual reconciliation because it is an extreme demonstration of our trust in the Lord. Wouldn't you say that? If we were to give more and more to the Lord, expecting Him to meet our needs in the culture in which we live, that's pretty radical. That's pretty extreme. But I think the end for Zacchaeus was to be a testimony for us who sit here in Binghamton, New York in 2015 to say the same God that was going to meet his needs back then is the same God that exists today. And if we have crossed that line of faith that Zacchaeus does and surrendered ourselves to Jesus as Lord, then can't we trust him? Because in Jesus' words, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So, how about financial reconciliation? I want to submit to you this morning that financial reconciliation is like spiritual reconciliation in these ways. Number one, it's based on faith in Christ. If we can trust God for our salvation, then we can trust God for anything else that we need. Amen? Secondly, financial reconciliation is like spiritual reconciliation in that it says the power in my life is Christ. Not mine. Because how many of us think in today's culture that the more money I have, the more power I have, the more influence I have, the more freedom I will have, the more friends I will have, the more stuff I will have, and so on. But we know that when we die, we leave it all. So what's the point? The only thing we can take with us are other souls. When we die, we leave it all. Financial reconciliation, like spiritual rec reconciliation, is other-centered as a testimony to Christ's work in my life and share in His love in tangible ways so we can demonstrate that love. Financial reconciliation, like spiritual reconciliation, lives according to Matthew 6.33, where it says, In my life I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. And you go back and you look at the list of those things. There was finances. There was fame. There was fortune. There was fitness. There's a whole list of things that God provides when we seek first 
the kingdom of God. And we don't have time to look this morning, but I just want to mention to you in Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 5 is the story of another tax collector. Tax collector's name was Matthew. He became a disciple of Jesus when Jesus walked up to him at the tax booth where he was collecting taxes from those Jewish people. And Jesus said, follow me. And Matthew immediately got up and left that business to follow Jesus. And he invited all his tax collectors and friends to his house to meet Jesus and put on a banquet in his name so he could introduce them to Jesus. He left his financial security and he shared with others the kingdom priority, which was reaching his peer group, which I find very interesting. Because Jesus has given us all a peer group to reach. Are we investing the resources he's given us to reach that peer group? And for you, it might be different than my peer group. And for the person sitting next to you, you have a circle of influence and friends that might be different than the person that's next to you. But are we investing our resources for kingdom purposes and reaching those people? That's what Matthew did when he left his tax booth. And he threw that party and invited Jesus. In closing, I want to share a couple of quotes with you, thinking in these terms of, of money and, and the reconciliation and freedom of finances. Voltaire said this, Don't think money does everything, or you are going to end up doing everything for money. Interesting thought. I like this one. Will Rogers, he said, Too many people spend money they haven't earned, buy things they don't want, to impress people they don't like. You gotta love that. But probably the most significant quote for today is this. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Jesus. Are you experiencing freedom from the financial issues of life? Are you being held captive by the almighty dollar and its overwhelming control of your life? I want to suggest to you this morning that if you have faith in Jesus Christ for your eternal life, you can have faith in Him for your financial matters. But you need to listen to His Word, and you need to submit to His Lordship in your life. Next week, we are going to talk about the pathway to financial freedom. I'm going to give you practical steps on how you can process week in and week out how you deal with money matters. And then March 8th, Chris Payne is going to uh, be our, I won't say guest speaker, since he's part of our family here, but he's going to be speaking. I'm going to be away, and uh, Chris is going to be filling in for us that day, so we're excited to have him do that. And then the following week, we're going to talk about biblical principles of financial freedom. That's going to kind of wrap up our money issues. Now, just by way of recapping, I want us to understand where we're at. We're looking at life for strife, right? We can live a life that is purposed by God with all the freedoms that he has given us. Or we can live a life of strife. A life that is full of stresses and tensions and pressures and things that make us feel uncomfortable and, and our lives overwhelmed and upheaved. But we have learned already that there are five things that if we put in order will help us to reduce the stresses and strife and to live that purpose-filled life. The first one, does anybody remember what it is? Connecting with God. It's the first one. The second one is our family. The third one Satisfying work. The fourth one, recreation. And the fifth one is exercise. And we look through the scriptures at those five things. And if we hold those things in balance, then we're going to reduce the stresses that come in our life. And here's why we're talking about finances. Because if we connect with God, right? We know it's coming to church. It's having our, our quiet time. That means we're listening to God. And one of the things, 15% of the teachings of Jesus relate to money. And so we're saying that if we're listening to God's word and we want to experience less stress, we're going to listen to him. And part of our connecting with God is connecting with him and what he says about money. You can have freedom from all the financial issues of life when you submit to God's plan and purpose for your life when it comes to those issues.
What a wonderful thing it is. Can you imagine a life without worrying about where the next meal is coming from, without, without the next dollar is coming from, and all of that. Some of you are saying, well, yeah, I've never been that way, and you probably haven't either. But I can tell you that's not true. Because there was a time when I was in college. This, this is a, no, no kidding. Sheila and I lived on beans and franks. Probably three nights a week out of a can. That's what we ate to get through. I was working in a gas station at night and going to school all day. She was working in a doctor's office. We had school bills and rent. I understand what it's like not to have a lot of needs. I understand that. And I think of the Apostle Paul when he said, I know what it is like because I've had to learn. That's a process, isn't it? I've had to learn to be content with what God gives. That's one of the first lessons of financial freedom. It's a contentment. If we're content with the offer of salvation, can we not be content with the offer of what he's given us to live on? Let's pray. Father, this certainly is a challenge. In the world we live in, there's so much stuff all around us, it's hard not to, to crave it, to desire it, to want it. You know, to have what others have. And we see these things, we understand them. Father, help us to have a perspective that would honor you. Help us to have that sense of surrender to your lordship. Not only in the area of salvation, but also in finances. For we know that where our heart is, there are treasures also. And might our heart be with you. Might we step out in faith and recognize your work in our hearts and in our walls. And we'll just thank you for what you will do in Christ's name. Amen. That's our prayer today, that we be open to God renewing that spirit in us and make us what he wants us to be. Again, I want to thank you for spending this hour with us. I trust that you've been open to what God might speak into your heart and uh, to your mind this morning. Uh, we have a fellowship dinner uh, that's going to take place in just a few minutes. And the gals are setting up downstairs. We invite you to stay. And uh, enjoy the meal with us. And uh, don't run off. So uh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for the food as well now. And uh, we'll make our way. Go down the stairs over here. Or the stairs over here. Make your way down to the kitchen. And then the tables are set up in Fellowship Hall. And uh, grab a plate, some food, and just enjoy that time together. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful for your word, for the challenges that it puts forth. Might uh, we truly renew our spirit uh, as you would have us in our hearts and our minds. Father, thank you for the food uh, that you have provided through the hands of many. And I just ask you to bless those that have prepared the food and, and bless us as we partake of it. We realize everything we have is from your hand. And we accept it with gratitude. And we thank you for it. Bless this time of fellowship, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless.